Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Diversified Energy Company PLC Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab that's just situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Please simply type in your questions at any time and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. These will be available via your Investor Meet Company dashboard and we'll notify you by email when these are ready for your review. Before we begin, I would like to submit the following poll and if you'd give that your kind attention, I'm sure the company will be most grateful. And I'll now like to hand over to CEO Rusty Hudson and CFO Eric Williams. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for um, everyone's time today. Uh, we're going to run through the presentation. Uh, this is Rusty Hudson. I'm the CEO of the company. Um, I'm going to start it off with some uh, general notes um, around 2021, uh, talk a little bit about uh, how I see the State of the Union, um, and then we'll talk a little bit uh, about the operational uh, overview and ESG, and then I'll turn it over to Eric to uh, discuss some of uh, the financial metrics, uh, and then I'll end it up with a, um, a 2022 outlook. Uh, if you will please turn to slide five we'll start we'll begin here um you know 2021 was a really transformational another transformational year for us um the mo what, what as i look at 2021 I, I take a look at it and say that the model uh that we introduced to the markets five years ago uh is absolutely working uh and responding the way that we anticipated it to uh, when we went public five years ago and and really as you look at this slide this these Four or five things on here uh, really um, are a direct overview of the company and, and the way that we set it up um, and what we told our investors back in 2017 when we went public. Uh, we said we would buy, we would be an, an acquirer of low decline, mature producing assets. Uh, as we sit here today, we have the lowest decline rate uh, in the US public, uh, in our US public peer base uh, with a 9% consolidated uh, decline rate, which is more than is half of most of the, the next lowest, which is 20%. Uh, so we've obviously kept true to that, to, to what we uh, committed to, which was long life, low decline assets, which is really uh, the basis of our model. Um, we said we wouldn't take price risk. Um, we're, we're, we're more of a, let's, let's take the prices, let's, let's hedge, uh, let's make sure that we're solidifying the cash flows uh, to operate the business, to manage our leverage, uh, and to return uh, and to, to pay a return to our shareholders through our dividend policy. As we sit here today, our production is 20 uh, in 2022 is 90% hedged approximately. Um, and we'll talk a little more about the hedging policy as we move through the, through the uh, presentation. Um, we're a cash generation company. Um, you know, we, our, our mantra is if you don't have cash flow, you don't have a business. Um, and so we built the business around cash flow and, and really over the last five years, being able to maintain a, a very strong margin, regardless of the price uh, environment that we're in, uh, as we ended 21, again, with a 50%, 50 percent plus margin. And we're generating strong cash flow. Uh, you'll see as we go through this presentation today, and we'll talk a little bit about the uses of cash, uh, but our free cash flow yield is over 20 percent. Uh, which is, uh, you know, big and, and has been that um, in that um, percentage now for several quarters. Um, and so we're generating a lot of cash flows. And really what that what that all sums up is in that top, um, you know, slide part of the of the slide, which is total shareholder return. You know, since inception, since we went public back in 2017, we've we've um, we have about 170, almost 180 percent total shareholder return over that period of time regardless of the price environment, which you can see on here, and we've sustained our dividend and increased it over that period of time pretty substantially. And that's that's the model and how we've built it since day one. Flipping to uh, slide six, some, some of the highlights uh, as I look at 2021, we obviously, uh, as I said, was a transformational year, but we entered into a new region of the country that we're calling our central region which was very strategic to us because it gives us an opportunity, um, to, a, another basin per se, um, to grow the business in the way that we have in the Appalachian and to duplicate what we've done there. Uh, we did four acquisitions uh, in that central region 
um, Texas, Louisiana, and Oklahoma, all of them of high margin assets, the same nature of asset that we talked about on the previous slide. So a very, very uh, strategic set of acquisitions. And we, <clears throat> our production volumes at, are at an all-time high. Uh, we averaged 119,000 BOE per day, but we ended the year at about 139,000 BOE per day, uh, which is a record. Um, we generated 343 million of hedged uh, adjusted EBITDA, um, which translated to a very high cash margin of 50%. Um, and we delivered 252 million of free cash flow, uh, which to me is is tremendous. Uh, because we don't um, develop as or develop assets, we uh, we only acquire existing production. Uh, we don't have the drill bit and the exploration costs that come along with it. Uh, so we, a lot of our cash flow or a lot of our EBITDA obviously goes straight to cash flow. Um, and then we continue to maintain a very low leverage, uh, pro forma leverage at 2.1 times, which is comfortably within the range that we've stated to the markets of two to two and a half. On page or on slide seven, uh, just talking a little bit about ESG, um, back in November at our capital markets day, uh, we committed uh, to $15 million in 2022 uh, in emissions related capital commitments. Uh, we are well on our way um, to, you know, on the, on the road to not only to spend that, but to, to, to do the, the projects that come along with it. Uh, we'll talk a little more about that in the, in, in the next few slides. Um, but all of this is for high impact projects. Um, and you'll see um, in a week or so when we uh, deliver our, third annual sustainability report that you'll see the, the improvements in the in the uh, uh, the lower intensity rates the lower emissions uh, that has come along with the projects that we've implemented uh, we've deployed our handheld uh, missions detection devices we've started our aerial surveys uh, and our conversion and elimination of pneumatic devices so we'll talk more about that um, We've committed to a 50% reduction in scope one of methane emissions by 2030. Uh, we did that back in November, I believe, uh, with an intermediate goal of 30% reduction by 2026. Uh, and we've accelerated our net zero emissions target uh, to 2040 from our original uh, ambition of 2050. And we'll, again, we'll get into all of those in a little more details in just a minute. Moving on to slide nine under the operation i'm going to go through a few of these operational slides um, and then i'll let eric pick up at the end of these again substantial progress on esg commitments we were really really uh happy uh with the initial uh, uh results uh, of our reduction initiatives um you know we spent a lot of time in the last 12 months uh, improving the accuracy of our emissions reporting uh, with our project fresh emissions inventory process um, lots of things going on there a lot of things to do with pneumatic devices and not only uh, identifying all of our pneumatic devices but also calculating true emissions off those pneumatic devices um, we realized 18 percent and six percent reductions in ghg and methane emissions intensity metrics compared to 2020 we we did go back and restate our 2020 uh, original reported uh, emissions after we were able to do uh, a much more precise measurement of our pneumatic device uh, emissions uh, and other emissions. And we took that emissions intensity, methane um, emissions intensity from 4.2 down to 1.6 on a, on a restated basis. And then in 21, we had another 6% decrease down to 1.5. So we're well on our way to, to doing or to, to hitting our commitments that we, that we, uh, committed to the markets back in November. And you can see the GHG emissions intensity, same thing. We went from a 3.8 revised 2020 down to a 3.1. So you can see that a lot of our, of our projects are now making an impact on our reported numbers. To give you just a real quick overview, you, we, we talked in November about putting uh, the, the emissions detection devices in the hands of our well tenders so that they could go on each and every well in the portfolio uh, to do actual measurements of emissions on each well and all the equipment around it. So far in 2022, uh, we have visited 14,000 sites uh, with these measurement devices. 
uh, at those sites, over at 12,000 or 85 percent of those sites had no detectable emissions. So 12,000 out of the 14,000 have zero emissions. In our previous reporting, that would have shown as all 14,000 wells having emissions because under the IPCC rules and under the EPA guidelines, if you have no measurement, then you get an allocated emission uh, that comes along with those wells, a leak, uh, leak metric or whatever they call it. So we are now starting to measure, which will give us even more, not only accuracy, but reductions uh, in the overall emissions in the portfolio. Uh, of those 15% uh, that did have detectable emissions, 10% of them were repaired immediately with a wrench or other methods of maintenance on the location at the time that we took the measurement. So we're making significant pro progress uh, with those detection devices, and that will continue throughout the year. Uh, you can see under the social, um, some of the things that you know we've done there, um, the external benchmark that we've hit of 69%, we've achieved 82% response rate. And then on our government governance, we've enhanced uh, the board diversity, uh, getting a 33% gender diversity goal um, as, as the market requires. So a lot of uh, improvements and a lot of activity as it relates to ESG. Moving on to slide 10, developing immediate long-term acquisition upside. You know, we, we acquire a lot of assets over the last five years. And, and what's really crucial to us as we acquire is being able to take over the assets, utilizing the, the personnel that were operating the, the uh, wells prior to us buying them. We're bringing those personnel along with us. <clears throat> They're showing us the low-hanging fruit the areas that need improvement, how we can en enhance production, uh, how we can save costs and money, uh, which are all crucial to the business model. Uh, and we've continued to see that play out as we've acquired into this new region and in the integration of assets there. Um, you know, we're unlocking immediate upside uh, through returning the central wells, uh, central region wells to production. There was a significant amount of wells in, in the Tapstone um, acquisition that we did. Uh, that were taken out of production by the previous owners uh, back in 2020 when the prices were really low and we're now realizing value by putting those back in production cleaning up wells fixing them doing all the things under our smarter asset management program uh, to create value um, and then leveraging shell operations expertise um, insights gained from the the barnett shell personnel have opportunities to improve our extend production in appalachia and all the shell wells that we're doing there so we're utilizing our personnel, our experiences, um, and and the and the people's uh, skill sets to go across the, the organization, across basins, across the asset types, um, and to generate long-term value uh, for our shareholders as we move forward. Moving on to slide 11, our smarter asset management in, in, in action. This is just a few examples of some of the things uh, that we've done. Uh, to create value and how the smarter asset management program plays out in our in our day to day operations, uh, a midstream pipeline pipeline addition. Um, we increased the volume of our gas rerouted for price optimization uh, with addition to previously constructed midstream assets. We built a pipeline and we were able to uh, connect that pipeline to a better uh, market, better pricing mark market pricing. Um, pipeline that we could get better pricing out of the gas that we were that we were selling. Uh, we've been able to work, um, you know, agreements to get pipeline fees eliminated. Um, and, you know, these can be very substantial costs. And so you go in and renegotiate and and, be, and are able to remove those fees. It's margin enhancement as we lower our cost to move our gas. Uh, we're right sizing compression. One of the biggest things I've seen is we've acquired assets over the years is the inability of previous owners to, to recognize and to reduce compression size, which has a substantial cost to the business. And so getting in there, right-sizing compression, eliminating compression when, when necessary, uh, and reducing the cost of moving the gas. Uh, and then the staffing model, making sure that we're improving our productivity using, uh, you know, um, computers and technology um, to, to, get better synergies in the business, reducing the, the, the amount of visits to wells, being able to model and, and provide material expense reductions and product, productivity gains from being able to manage the, the, the staffing model appropriately 
And that's another big uh, opportunity every time we buy assets. Flipping to page 12, and then we will turn it over to Eric on the next slide. Uh, just talking about the production reserves, we've seen significant, talked about the production uh, increase, 35% increase in the exit rate from 2020 uh, to 2021, uh, which is also, you know, net of any kind of decline rates in the portfolio. Uh, we have also seen a 20, 27% increase in our reserve base uh, up, uh, from 2020, end of year 2020, uh, with a PV10 value at the end of 2020, $1.9 billion. And as we sit here today, uh, a $3.8 billion PV10 value uh, on our portfolio. And if you, you look at that, that's a substantial 50% increase year over year, well, 100% increase year over year, and just which is based on not only the production, but also in the pricing metrics that we're seeing in the portfolio. Um, so all in all, a very transformational year, uh, more of the same from an operational perspective uh, in how we operate the assets. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Eric to talk a little bit about the ARO and some of the financial metrics. Thanks, Rusty, and, and thank you all for joining. I'll pick up on page 13 and talk a little bit about the operation side of our asset retirement program, and then I'll come back to that again in the financial portion to talk about what that uh, means with respect to uh, cash flow over the longer term. But uh, really proud of the progress that we've made on our asset retirement efforts. Um, I'll start looking at the, the graph that you see in the, the bottom right hand corner uh, and remind that about a year ago, we uh, invested in our first internal plugging crew to begin to build in-house talent and, and um, expertise in this area. Because we know that over the long haul, we'd like to vertically integrate and bring this into just part of our, our overall business and apply the same smarter asset management techniques which is just a disciplined approach to our operations to retiring our own assets. And you'll see that last year we plugged 136 wells uh, and inclusive of the crews that we had already um, that we had already stood up and grown internally. And then at the end of the year, investing in a, an additional plugging company, we did about a third of our of our uh, plugging jobs over the course of the year with our internal efforts. Uh, and you'll see how that translates into cost savings over the, the longer term. Uh, now that we've invested in Next Level Energy that we talked about um, in the fourth quarter, uh, we have a total of six teams, or we're on our way to six teams, that'll give us the capacity to plug uh, 200 wells per year, which is the amount that we've committed to plug beginning by 2023. Uh, so we're certainly on our, well, on our way to be able to plug 100% of our own wells uh, in the nearer term. And we will continue to expand our capacity here, targeting, targeting at least 10 to 12 crews total, which will provide us the capacity to plug anywhere from 350 to 400 wells. And so what that'll give us is that excess capacity not only allows us uh, significant vertical integration, uh, it'll allow us to build relationships with other parties, including the states, uh, as we plug wells for others, uh, which will enhance our ability to learn how we plug uh, different types of wells over different types of states uh, that'll enhance our own internal efforts uh, but importantly, it'll allow us to generate cash flow off of that ex excess capacity that not only will offset our uh, our internal costs, uh, but also diversify and provide additional sources of, of revenue in an area that I think we all see is, is growing significantly, given the amount of uh, federal money that's even flowing into the states to, to begin to retire orphan wells. So really excited where this is going. You can see that the four points we really highlight. Uh, is <clears throat> across those 33 jobs that we did internally, we were able to plug those uh, using in-house talent for 30% less uh, than what we paid for a third party to come in and plug for us. And our third party costs were already significantly lower than our peers because of the way that we manage the overall program using our internal employees uh, to fully prepare a site and, uh, and have it very much optimized and ready for that that rented uh, equipment and talent to come on site and complete the job. So a 30% incremental saving off of already low cost is, is really an exceptional start. And I'm excited to see where that'll go. Uh, as I said, given that the investment that we've made in ne next level energy, uh, we have the internal capacity now to plug our, uh, our stated commitment of 200 wells per year. Uh, importantly, remember that, that we operate across uh, over 10 states now. So we may not have our crews uh, across that entire footprint to plug every well. So we may continue to use some third party services uh, and we'll continue to do that in a very optimized uh, fashion using our own internal team to, to prepare those sites. 
Uh, but over time, we'll have a, a broader and broader, broader footprint of our internal teams and, and continue to do more and more of our own work. And as I said, not only does this provide us uh, the opportunity to generate additional revenue and offset our costs, uh, importantly, it, it does act as an inflation uh, offset and, and uh, buffer uh, by eliminating the, thir the third party margin and, um, and labor cost creep that you can see with third parties. I'll transition now to 15 as we move more into the financial update. And this is really more of a placeholder slide to remind that we did publish a very fulsome and comprehensive 2021 um, annual reports and accounts that you can pull from our website. And that provides, of course, all of our IFRS uh, financial statements uh, and required disclosures, along with various uh, alternative performance measures and the, and the required reconciliations back to IFRS. Uh, we also include those in the appendix of this presentation. So I, I would encourage you to take a look at those as you go. But but you can see an important milestone, as Rusty talked about, 2021 was a transformational year. Uh, we did over a billion dollars of, of uh, gross acquisitions. Um, about two thirds of those we split with Oak Tree, our, our financial partner under our joint operating agreement. But we operate all of those assets because we're operating them on behalf of Oak Tree uh, as well. So that significant footprint will afford us the ability to begin to grow scale, uh, primarily in the central region, just as we did in Appalachia, that I think you'll see uh, will translate into a, even enhanced financial performance over the long term as we seek to replicate that Appalachian success. To that end, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit just broadly on page 16. You know, we used to talk about uh, our overall cost structure and how that complemented margins. But with the entry into the central region, that dynamic has changed a bit because the central region, while it does have notionally higher operating costs, it also has access to better and, and more premium price end markets for the sale of its commodities. And so what you see in the graph is that both cost per unit, but also realized price per unit are moving up in tandem, allowing us to maintain that 50 percent margin uh, over both years. And so you can certainly see that, that given that we're in the early innings of, of central region before we've had the opportunity to really prosecute our smarter asset management, work to optimize that cost structure uh, using the, the same techniques that we have in Appalachia, uh, believe that we'll be able to further widen that margin over time. Uh, but it, even so, you see that consistent 50% margin, 54% last year, 50% this year. But what I'd really point out is, is what we built the business to do, as Rusty said, is, is generate consistent cash flow, regardless of how volatile the commodity uh, is. And if you think about where we were just a couple of years ago with natural gas prices on a realized basis uh, at $2 or less, uh, seeing the front end of the curve today at over $5.50 is tremendous. Uh, and so while we have, uh, through our hedging program, locked in a, a number lower than that. We're hedged at about $3.20 this year in 2022 uh, is, a, is a level that, given our cost structure, allows us to generate a very healthy margin to make sure that the, the dividend that we built the company to deliver for investors is very much safe and secure. And so you can see that last year, our hedge program added 16 points uh, to our cash margin, and this year it gave back 15 but year over year, very stable uh, to, to navigate through commodity cycles. Uh, so something we're very, very proud of. We are leaning into the current curve. Uh, certainly, we like to average in through the hedge program. As, as Rusty said, we're 90% hedged this year, but we added about 15% of that over the nearer term. And, and the, the values that we were layering in on those incremental hedged volumes were at 50% premiums to the portfolio average at that time. And we've been building uh, a, a larger position in 2023 as well. And the, the nearer term prices that we've been layering in are 30 percent higher than the, the average portfolio at, at the time. So certainly looking to capture that. And then even if you look out over the longer term, I was looking this morning, if you look out through 2034, uh, you can see that natural gas is up over 50 percent on the back end of the curve. It, it used to just crest at about three dollars and 25 cents. And, and today on the back end is is it? Uh, about five and a half dollars. So significant improvement. And that's certainly something that we will now be able to reach forward and, and pull forward through our, our long dated reserve portfolio. Turning to 17, you know, we talked about that asset retirement progress that we had made and highlighted that by shifting from using third party services to using in-house talent and beginning to vertically integrate, 
um, we're seeing early times a 30% reduction in the cost of plugging uh, those wells. And that's significant. You know, I like to point out that that's using today's techniques and today's technology, uh, but certainly believe that as we see significant capital now flowing into the space with the, with the federal government contributing uh, capital to help states plug uh, orphan wells, you're similarly seeing additional capacity stood up across the industry. And that competition for those dollars will drive uh, innovation and, and, um, and new efficiencies that we don't yet see today. And we've seen that same cycle play out through the drilling and completion uh, aspects of our industry back when uh, commodity prices fell in 2014 and break evens were closer to $80 uh, per barrel of oil. But through innovation and, and, and willpower, the industry got those break evens to as low as $20, $20 uh, per barrel. And so I certainly believe that that same type of, of renaissance can take place in ARO. But even if it didn't, even if all we could do was take our internal teams and realize that same 30% savings across our entire portfolio over time, uh, that translates that $1.7 billion of, of undiscounted gross asset retirement liability, which you, for those of you who have followed us for some, some time, we have a, a, a supplemental presentation on our website that goes through our asset retirement in a lot of detail, talking about how we think about uh, what wells to retire, when a well is ready for retirement, uh, and then the cost associated with retiring that well, and then how that undiscounted asset retirement obligation rolls through to our audited financial statements uh, as an asset retirement obligation on our balance sheet. Uh, but you'll see an undiscounted value of 1.7 billion. 30% savings translates into $500 million of incremental uh, shareholder value. Uh, that given that, that our models already accounted for CapEx and taxes and GNA, is a dollar for dollar return either through enhanced dividends or through reinvestment to the business. So this is really, I think, a significant milestone for us to have the, the, the amount of internal club plugging capacity that we have uh, able to plug uh, about 200 wells per year, targeting that 350 to 400 well capacity, uh, which will give us the, the added ability to continue to learn and ultimately deliver this value for shareholders. Moving on to 18, you know, just talked about the ways that we think about sustaining our business and doing that through organic cash flow generation. Uh, certainly over the last five years, as we've been listed uh, in London, the first couple or first three as a name listed company and the last two as a premium listed company, uh, we've, we've issued equity along the way to transform this business. Uh, when I joined almost five years ago in 2017, our, our EBITDA was around $11 million a year on the back of our second acquisition going to about $30 million a year. Uh, and you can see that we've increased that by over 11 times uh, to in 2021, delivering $343 million of, of EBITDA. Uh, so tremendous growth, and we've used equity along the way, but we've always partnered that, and we'll, we'll turn to this in a moment, partnered it with low-cost uh, debt financing as well to make sure that we generate uh, healthy returns for our investors. But as we now have a significant base of, of cash flow, that we have the opportunity to not only sustain the business, but to grow the business within our means and without additional equity. And, and that's what this slide is intended to illustrate. If you take that 343 million, um, just using last year as a base, and you peel off the, the cash taxes, interest, um, what, what amount of CapEx we have, mostly on our midstream system and other uh, cash costs, you're left with uh, $252 million of free cash flow, which is a 40% a free cash flow margin, very, very healthy. Uh, that we then use for two primary purposes, uh, to distribute a tangible return to our shareholder in the form of a dividend, and that was $130 million this year, uh, leaving about an equal portion available to reinvest into the business. And that could be in the form of, of debt paydowns, uh, which ultimately generates and builds additional liquidity that we could deploy on non-dilutive growth in the future, um, or uh, to just simply buy an acquisition uh, or do a combination of the two. But you can see a very healthy amount of cash that allows us to sustain that dividend uh, and sustain the business over the long term. And we've done that in, in, uh, with a backdrop. And if you remember the very first slide that Rusty showed, a backdrop of a continuously in, in enhanced dividend per share. Because if we are going to uh, or have requested uh, an equity contribution along the way, we've only done that when on a per, per share basis, we're able to generate uh, additional cash flow and ultimately grow that dividend having done so for 10 consecutive raises uh, since our IPO. 
Moving to 19, as I said, you know, when we have raised equity, we've always partnered it with uh, low cost financing. And over time, that, 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 the, the, the content of that financing has changed a bit. When we began, it was, uh, was nearly 100% uh, RBL or revolving credit facility debt uh, that was very low cost, but it had um, drawbacks that were related to redetermination. So you didn't always know what your credit line would be. And so we knew that long-term assets needed to be paired with proper long-term financing. Uh, and so looking across the landscape, thing, you know, financing like high yield was just not of interest to us. We felt that it wasn't suited for the PDP, uh, you know, naturally delevering uh, profile that we like to maintain. So in 2019, we uh, initiated the asset-backed securitizations. We were the first operated asset-backed securitization financing uh, in our industry and uh, have since begun to really grow that portion of our, of our uh, leverage profile. So essentially what we now have is just two components of our, of our long-term debt. You have our a revolving credit facility, uh, and then you have amortizing term loans or asset-backed securitizations that make up the other. And you can see that over time, we've allocated the mix um, a bit differently. And with, with really a target, I'd say where we, lent, where we left 2020, is wherever the long term you'd see us sit with about 70% in the amortizing structures and keeping anywhere from uh, 15 to 30% in the RBL. And the reason we do that is because we generate so much cash. We like to have some on the RBL so that we can we can pay that down with our liquidity uh, as opposed to just building cash on the balance sheet that has that can have negative carry in a low interest rate environment. Um, but at the end of the day, what we do is we're ultimately looking to match that low risk, low coupon, if you recall, sub 5% coupon against our asset base that is naturally delivering, it's fully amortizing. So you see that glide path uh, to reducing debt over time. And we've maintained that consistent, you see in the, the yellow boxes, uh, two-ish times leverage across that period of time, which given how hedge protected it is and given how low our declines are, is a very, very comfortable leverage. But ultimately, as we as we refinanced, if you'll recall, in the first quarter of this year, uh, five hundred and twenty five million dollars of our of our credit facility borrowings into those securitizations, the long term amortizing. You see that the mix went to 90 percent ABS, just 10 percent on the RBL. But importantly, because the advance rates on those asset backed securitizations are higher than the advance rates on the assets we get under the RBL you see nearly a, a significant increase in our liquidity going from 261 million to 412 million. So talking about what we do with that liquidity, I'll, I'll wrap up on 20 and just point out that um, you know, that liquidity positions us uh, for a significant amount of, of non-dilutive growth as we look to go forward. Um, if you took full year averages, you can see that, that 2020's uh, liquidity was 200. $12 million, so nearly a 94%, almost 100% increase, taking us up to 412. And if you look back at, at the central region acquisitions that we did, uh, those were on average between two and a half and three times. Uh, so we were able to buy at lower cash flow multiples in this price environment. And because our stated leverage limit is two to two and a half times, we're able to use more leverage and have uh, less need for either organically generated cash or certainly equity uh, contributions along the way. To, to sustain and grow this business. And so if you took that $412 million and you think about paying a three times multiple, that amount of liquidity could essentially buy you about $140 million of, of EBITDA, uh, which is significantly more than our average corporate decline of, of about eight and a half percent is the amount of EBITDA that's rolling over with that. So if you think about $343 million of, of EBITDA last year, 10% of that would be 35 million. Um, so we're south of that from a decline perspective, and yet this liquidity could purchase 140 million. So significantly more EBITDA uh, uh, acquisition capacity uh, than our very low decline rate um, would have rollover. So very uh, excited about where we sit with respect to looking forward into 2022 uh, and the opportunity to, to, to sustain and grow the business. And I will, uh, Hand it back over to Rusty for a couple of uh, closing comments before we do Q and A. Thanks, Eric. I appreciate it. Uh, 2022. We're really excited about the year. We we uh, obviously we're already three months in, which is crazy. But um, as we look at this year, we we see a, a backdrop uh, that's pretty exciting. We see a commodity price environment that has set up for some uh, pretty substantial increases in revenue. 
Uh, we're seeing uh, a market that is uh, prepped and ready uh, for divestiture. Uh, we're seeing a lot of activity out there in the markets. Uh, so we're really excited about the backdrop in which we're that we're entering the year. Uh, some of the main things that, you know, as I sit here as CEO, what I want to uh, accomplish and what I look at is, uh, as we plan for 2022, uh, we want to continue to maintain focus on our execution uh, in our field operations. Uh, we believe that there are some um, projects out there that we can uh, utilize organic cash flow to, uh, to uh, make happen that will have a high internal rate of returns. And so we're going to focus on a few of those this year. Uh, and I'm pretty excited about that because we do see some midstream projects and such that would have uh, nice impacts on our on our revenue and on our margins. And um, we're going to attack emissions. Um, we, we talk about aggressively driving reductions in absolute emissions. I just call it attack emissions. We're going to get after emissions this year. We're going to continue to uh, roll out the handheld uh, devices and and you know measure the wells and the equipment around the wells. We've started our flyover, uh, Eldar um, flyovers, and have begun to um, identify uh, emissions there. Um, although so far it's been smaller uh, emissions, uh, we have found some on other people's pipelines uh, that we're communicating to them. Uh, but at the end of the day, these are ways for us to cover a lot of ground in a very short period of time uh, with these flyovers. Uh, and then we obviously are, are working hard on the pneumatic devices, so that will continue throughout uh, 2022. Um, we will continue to uh, monitor uh, the acquisi acquisition landscape. Um, we're seeing a lot of activity in the markets, um, which gets me uh, really excited because we're sitting here with a lot of liquidity right now at 400 million. Um, I've told our internal group we want to have 600 to 700 million of liquidity uh, because I believe this year, uh, the, the, the opportunity set in front of us is vast um, and a lot of things for us to look at uh, to determine whether or not we want to participate. Uh, and we're going to execute on some of those. And so we're ready to do that. Um, so enhancing liquidity uh, and reinvesting that free cash flow is, is the way that we uh, get returns for our shareholders. And so we're going to focus on that heavily this year. Um, continue to look at ways to capture higher pricing in this environment. We're at 90% hedged, but as we look at 23 and forward, Eric was referencing it earlier, a, a great price environment. And we're starting to see for the first time in a while for the, uh, the price curve as it relates to natural gas, um, start to inch up in the back years and start to show some progress there, which is uh, for the first time in a while mm -hmm. that we're seeing that. So we're, we're pretty excited about that. We're going to, look at ways to uh, take advantage of that. Um, and then, you know, the last, you know, we'll, we'll continue to focus on our plugging. We think that that is a big, um, we can take something that most people would look at and say, okay, you've got a lot of wells to plug over a long period of time, but we're going to take that and, and turn it around and say, not only are we going to manage our ARO liability over a period of time, we're going to help the states and others to manage their orphan well programs and the government money and the federal money that they're getting. Uh, and we're gonna make revenue stream off of it that we can then turn into margin for the business. So we're excited about everything. Um, and I will conclude up my remarks there and turn it over for any kind of questions that you may have. Yeah, Eric, just real quick, Russ. I, I, you know, if I could, just to, to compliment what Rusty said, I'm, I'm looking at the natural gas curve and and I think he, him talking about the outlook, we used to say, you know, we believed that we lived in a 250 to 350 gas sort of range bound world and, and the, you know, not not distant past events and what we're living through has changed that paradigm a bit. And so right now, you know, you've got 567 for the rest of this year, four dollars and 40 cents next year, 372 the next year, 370 the next year, 375 the next year. So every year is above the top end of where, you know, previously we really would have felt the longer term outlook for natural gas sad. And, with the increasing dialogue around um, increasing the liquidification exports, which will provide uh, broader end markets for U.S. natural gas, I think we're incredibly excited about the long-term natural gas prospect. And and while oil, you know, you certainly see it over $100 per barrel today, that price curve over the the long term is is still very backwardated. Um, $95 for the rest of this year. $84 next year, $77 the next year, $73 dropping to 70, 
uh, and it stays in backwardation because I think there's certainly a, a, a longer term uh, optimism that natural gas is that bridge fuel uh, to, to more and more renewables over time, uh, which is going to bode very well for natural gas prices. And, and certainly mm -hmm. uh, as we have additional um, unhedged volumes out in the longer term, uh, is value that we'll look to capture and continue to push our uh, our reserve values higher. And I just remind that you know too, uh, the reserve values that Rusty went through. Importantly, unlike many ENPs that you may be familiar with, ours are it's a PDP only reserve value, um, and we've got millions of acres of of uh, held by production land with untapped uh, additional re reserve potential. That is all incremental upside to that PDP, what's already producing today value. So a uh, tremendous amount of value, I think, that, that we've built into the business. We're excited about where uh, the commodity sits and, and our ability to be part of the transition through wisely stewarding uh, the resource that the industry's already uh, spent, spent capital developing. So uh, with that, uh, we'll now hand it back to you for Q&A. Eric, Rusty, thank you very much indeed for your presentation this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab that's just situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, but just while the team take a few moments to review those questions submitted already, I would like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your investor dashboard. Rusty, Eric, as you can see, we received a number of questions, both that came in ahead of today's event, as well as a number that have come through uh, throughout today's presentation. Firstly, can I thank all investors for submitting their questions? And Rusty, Eric, if I may, I wanted to start off the Q&A session with these uh, two questions that are both uh, similar in theme. The first one reads as follows. When does a company expect to move forward with a US share listing? And the second question reads, considering the current downturn in US market indices, do you think there is the perfect year for you to list on a major US market index and ride the bounce back next year whilst gaining exposure to funds? Yeah, no, I, I, that's a great question. I'll let Eric opine on it also. But we're in the process as we sit here today. Uh, we finished up our second annual PwC re, uh, audit. Um, we've we've been working extremely hard on the process of what we need to do to um, to get the US ADR listing, uh, which we anticipate will occur mid year this year. Uh, so we're working hard on that. Um, it's obviously a very uh, important for us to be able to open up a new uh, shareholder um, or a new institutional shareholder opportunity set for us. Uh, and, and really, uh, the logical next step for us is to get those U.S. investors um, into our shares. And to do that, we need that ADR uh, to get a more broad-based um, uh, shareholder, um, you know, U.S. shareholder. And so we're working hard on that. Eric, you can maybe give them just yeah, a little yeah. specifics around the process. Well, yeah, and, and, and I'd clarify that, you know, with respect to timing, you know, we're, we're rowing in that direction, but certainly haven't set definitive timing as to when we would complete that process. Um, it is something that on the back end of the full year results, we're, we're much more uh, well positioned to, to progress forward. Uh, having had PwC engaged uh, for the last two years, uh, and having proactively done our audits to the U.S. PCAOB standard level, uh, that would be necessary to move forward with the appropriate filing. So uh, it is a, a top priority because we do believe that that we have a business model and a result quite candidly with 180% TSR over the last uh, two years, or since our IPO rather, um, and significant tangible shareholder return that the U.S. markets are looking for. So we believe that'll be a nice complement to uh, an incredible base of, of uh, shareholders that we have uh, in the U.K. And so so it is something that we'll turn our attention to and, and work to progress uh, this year. That's great. The next question that we have here reads as follows. How has the U.S. policy environment around methane emissions and overall energy production changed since the start of the Ukraine war and the run up in oil and gas prices? Well, I would say that you know, I don't know if the U.S., uh, you know, the way that the U.S. policies have really changed much. You know, one thing I will tell you, we're, we're being listed in London. We're ahead of the game as it relates to ESG, methane emissions and all those uh, different factors uh, versus the U.S. Uh, peers. Uh, the U.S. is getting acclimated and starting to, to roll out uh, emission standards. But at the end of the day, you know, it's I don't know if it's changed much. I will say that uh, I think that there has become much more awareness around the fact that, you know, 
U.S. natural gas is not a bridge fuel or a transition fuel. It is part of the transition, and it will always be part of the transition. Uh, we we put out a um, one of my friends, Toby Rice at EQT, one of our hashtags, our hashtag unleash U.S. LNG. We believe that U.S. natural gas and the LNG uh, market is the biggest green initiative on the planet and has the potential to displace more coal production and coal, and coal uh, electricity generation than anything else out there. Uh, so we believe that uh, you know U.S. Uh, natural gas is the future, um, and, and you know obviously Europe um, is getting um, the need for more of that, uh, trying to get away from Russian uh, natural gas, and uh, we believe that the U.S. is in a very good place. And, you know, really, if you look at natural gas prices in the U.S., it's always been a domestic priced market. Um, and so it's always been lower than the international prices. As we uh, export more and more of the product, we believe that that's going to to move up and, and start to more closely mirror the international benchmarks. And so uh, we believe and, and we love the fact that it's not just a transition fuel. It is a fuel for the future. That's great. I know you touched on this uh, throughout the presentation, but a question that we have here reads as follows. What are your plans for the $400 million of liquidity that now have that you now have post the two recent ABS financings? Yeah, no, we obviously it's there was a reason for that liquidity. And, and um, you know, we and like I said, I'd like to see it above 600. I think we'll get there. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's it's purely for growth purposes. Uh, as we sit here in this market, uh, we're evaluating a lot of different things. Um, we're we're capable of of executing on some pretty large deals potentially this year, and so that's that's essentially the use for it. And we're going to continue to the the two main factors. We're going to be all over liquidity this year. We're going to be constantly looking for ways to improve and in, 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 in increase our liquidity position so that we can take advantage of these big opportunities when they come. Uh, so um, so that, that would be the main and, and primary purpose of the liquidity. Thank you very much indeed for that. The next question that we have here reads as follows. You mentioned that you will evaluate strategically aligned opportunities. Are there any opportunities in the near term in this regard? Well, you know, without saying a whole lot, yeah, I mean, there's always, we're, we're evaluating acquisitions, we're evaluating opportunities consistently. Um, and, you know, we did four acquisitions last year, uh, three of them back to back to back uh, in May, June timeline. So they typically come pretty, you know, uh, pretty quickly and, and sometimes they come all at once. And so, it, and that's probably been the biggest challenge is, is the number of deals in the market and trying to evaluate them all at the same time. You have to be picky and you have to look at the ones that are going to have the best value for our shareholders over the long term. Um, and so and sometimes that can be disguised. You have to really look at deals and say, all right, where they're at, the type of deals they are, you know, what's the multiples, you know, a lot. And, and the beauty of this of this uh, market that we're in right now, some of the things that we value deals and, and the metrics that we used previously aren't really what we're looking at now because uh, we, we have a different pricing environment. We have to look at things a little differently. So um, so we could see deals at any time, I guess, is the answer to that. Yeah, question. and I'd, I'd just say that, that you saw us take an Appalachian asset that was small at the, at the beginning of our journey and grow that into a significant footprint that allowed us to get more and more efficient, drive costs out of the system, really insulate ourselves from uh, inflationary pressure by being vertically integrated. And, and we see that same opportunity now sitting in the central region. We've, we've done, as Rusty said, four different deals over the course of la the second half of last year, which gives us presence over a significant portion of that target area that now we can begin to infill. And so those don't have to be big transactions. Those could be some of the smaller, very nice bolt-ons that we'll tuck in and begin to leverage the existing team that we have uh, to drive cost out and improve those margins. But, but also importantly, we've demonstrated that our model is very transient. And, and so if there are assets of scale or, or areas of additional opportunity, you know, we're fortunate that we can look out, you know, really anywhere that we see value and then we work to retain the existing teams. Um, so we really we would remind that when we talk about strategically oriented uh, or aligned, 
we're, we're an asset profile company. We like the long life, low decline type of an asset that tucks into the portfolio that we can hedge and protect those cash flows over the long term. Uh, and for sure, certainly see a lot of opportunity in this environment. And so, as Rusty said, it is about being very selective as to what we fold in. That's great. Uh, the next question that we have here reads as follows. Uh, what do you see as the greatest risk to the business? The, the greatest risk to the business? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's always, to me, um, stay away from high leverage. Don't don't over lever the business. Don't get caught up in let's do a deal regardless of how it impacts the balance sheet. Um, we don't ever want to be in that position. I've, I've made a commitment to to our management team and also to our employees that, guys, we will never over lever the business. We're going to keep our balance sheet strong so that we can always be in a position of strength uh, and, and be on the offense. Um, and then, you know, operationally, you, you always want to make sure that uh, you're taking on assets, you're acquiring assets, and that you're managing them appropriately, uh, making sure that you're operating the assets in a way that's you know, being a good steward, uh, and then managing, you know, the obvious uh, climate emissions and those kind of things, being proactive and being all over. So I, I think that those are probably the biggest risks. And, and what we try to do is be out on our front foot, knowing what those risks are and, and manage them appropriately. Thank you very much for that. The next question that we have here reads as follows. How will you cope with the significantly increased inflation expectations which are developing? Yeah, no, I think, you know, it's a great question. The good news about our company is, is that we're very vertically integrated. And so we don't really, uh, we're not exposed to a lot of the inflationary pressures that some of the developers and, and the ones that are drilling because they're using third party services. Um, we pretty much manage most of our business internally. We use very, very little uh, third party services. That's one of the reasons why we went out and, and started to acquire, um, you know, these uh, plugging companies, the, the next level that we acquired last late last year. And and then we've started to put our own plugging crews on the ground because we didn't want to get caught up in that. We want to make sure that we're <clears throat> managing our ARO liability uh, and our near term liability in a way that keeps the cost down as low as possible. And we found that doing it ourselves was the way to do that. And then also managing against any inflationary uh, uh, pressure that may come with all this federal money being given to the states. And they're going to have to ramp up and try to get rid of and plug their orphan wells. So uh, that's the way we manage the business. We don't have a lot of third party services. So most and, and we really to this point uh, haven't seen a lot of, um, you know, uh, employee compensation inflation either. So um, so we're 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 watching it, we're tracking it. We're not completely immune to it, but at the same time, we're in a lot better position than most because we are very vertically integrated. Yeah, and just to complement that to provide a little color for you is yeah, obviously where you see wage inflation, it tends to be in the more urban areas around the cities and in our business, given that our wells are are situated in in more rural areas, mm -hmm. we're not competing against uh, the talent that cities are. Um, and we talked about Capital Markets Day. One of the things we're really proud of from a social perspective on ESG is that our average employee, in addition to um, great benefits that we provide, including 100% of employee health care, uh, is that our, our wages are nearly twice the state average uh, in the states that we operate. You focus on Appalachia, uh, which does provide us a natural uh, barrier to that because we're already very well compensating our teams. I, and then much of our footprint doesn't sit around areas that are being active, actively developed and therefore where you may see some some um, activity by offset operators. So that natural, as, as Rusty said, vertical in integration is, is insulating us from that service cost reflation. That tends to affect those who are developing because the first costs that, that rise are the drilling rigs and the completion crews. Uh, but we do the maintenance we do to sustain our, our low decline production is captured in our LOE, which is generally labor. So uh, that's why I think we feel uh, certainly more comfortable than most in, in this inflationary environment. Thank you very much for that. The next question that we have here relates to higher energy prices, and it reads as follows. Is the cost of acquiring new assets increasing a lot as a result of higher energy prices? Well, intuitively, you would say that it should. Um, but what I would say is, is that because of the type of deals that we look for, so we're a, we're a PDP buyer, we're buying existing production. We're not buying any undeveloped acreage or, or allocating value to, of our deals to the undeveloped asset, which is much more sensitive 
to not only the, the existing price environment, but where the, the existing or where the price environment goes from here. Um, so what's very important to us is that we are buying assets based on the existing prices, but we're hedging it aggressively, <coughs> excuse me, aggressively in the first 12 months, especially, which is locking in the value that we've, that we've, that we've allocated to the deal. So the, the, the actual price of the deals, which is based on strip price has come up some, but we're managing that by, by hedging the price, uh, especially in the front months, which is where most of the price increase sits as we sit here today. Now, what I will tell you is, is that the increase in the purchase price has been limited. You would think it would be more, but it's been limited by the in, inability of buyers to access capital. And so you can think an asset's worth as much as you want, and it may even really be that. But at the end of the day, if you can't find anybody that can get capital to pay that price, then it really doesn't matter. You know, things are only worth what people can pay for it. So we think that between the price environment and our ability to hedge, uh, you know, the deal price or the deal allocated values in that first 12 months, uh, and, and our ability to access capital uh, gives us an advantage uh, that some others may not have because I'm telling you, capital is still not easy to come by. And that you, so the question earlier about our liquidity and what we're going to do with it, that's why we've been so aggressive on uh, increasing the liquidity uh, is so that we are ready and able uh, to execute and transact where others may not have that capability. So, um, so all in all, I think the prices have come up a little bit. We're managing that because we can hedge, but at the end of the day, they're probably not up substantially because of the inability of people to access capital. Thank you very much for that. I know we're just coming up to the hour, but maybe if we could just tackle these final two questions that have come through sure. from investors. Uh, the first one we have here reads as follows. Regarding in-house well retirement teams, is a 30% saving you talk about applicable across the whole ARO? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And it, today it's not. You know, as I talked about last year, we did about a third of our jobs using our in-house talent. Uh, that was primarily focused on West Virginia, where we stood up our first cruise. Um, given the acquisition of Next Level Energy, you should expect to see us begin to do more of that work across some other states with a longer term goal, building out that 350 to 400 uh, team capacity, well, well plugging capacity that we could then use across our entire portfolio or our entire footprint. That'll take place over time. So in the interim, we'll continue to use a mix of third party services based on where the, the well retirements take place and our own. And if we have excess capacity where we're sitting today, even at 200 wells per year, we may outsource part of that where our crews are and then use third party services elsewhere. Uh, and so so over time, that's why I, I was making the point that we believe we can begin to achieve that 30 percent savings across the entire portfolio. Um, but early time that was focused on West Virginia. And, and importantly, this isn't just me talking about lower costs translating into lower asset retirement. If you, if you look at our annual reports and accounts, which of course are audited, um, I believe it's page 164 is where we have the asset retirement footnote, obligation footnote. And on the, the subsequent page, there's a footnote that talks about the um, revisions to our estimates. And, and most of that was the acquisitions that we brought on additional acquisitions and therefore that came with some additional asset retirement obligation. But importantly, about $30 million of the, the balance sheet liability was reduced because of those lower costs that we actually incurred plugging our own wells uh, over the course of that year. And if you looked at our undiscounted, I talked about it previously was 1.7 billion. If you pulled our reserve report, you know those numbers, uh, you know that 1.7 and Appalachia is 1.4 on a net basis to us with an incremental addition of, of 200 million uh, from the central region. So our total liability, including the central region, uh, is now at it, it under 1.7 at 1.6 billion. So you're seeing that number um, uh, even on the quote audited basis begin to come down, uh, but certainly gives us a lot of confidence given the, the early time progress from using our in-house crews that it will continue to trend lower. But uh, but over the next couple of years, you, you should expect to see a hybrid where we'll use our own capacity uh, alongside selected third parties um, and, but importantly, remember, we do partner with those third parties to make that process as efficient as possible, because the most 
expensive aspect of using a third party is time because you're essentially renting their talent and you're renting their equipment. And so if we send our team in first to make sure that the road to the site is, is well prepared, that the site has been groomed, ready for the equipment to show up, when that equipment shows up, it goes right to work and then uh, we're able to get them in and out very quickly. That's how we achieve our lower costs, lower than our peers, because in many cases they're, they're uh, paying for just a turnkey solution that third party is doing all that work that we already supplement. And, and those costs are just captured in our, our standard LOE alongside our asset retirement. So uh, so really excited about where we'll continue to see those numbers trend lower. Thank you very much for that. And perhaps uh, just time for one last question to conclude the Q&A session. Have you ever considered an international acquisition strategy or are you very much US focused for the foreseeable future? We're totally 150% US focused. Um, we have no international um, desire, any desire to to go outside the, the uh, continental U.S. Keep it simple. Eric, Rusty, that's great. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you for addressing all of the questions that have come through from investors this afternoon. Of course, if there are any further questions submitted today, we will make these available immediately after the presentation has ended. And ladies and gentlemen, we'll publish those responses where it's appropriate to do so on the Investor Meet Company platform. And we'll notify you by email when these are ready for your review. Eric, Rusty, perhaps before redirecting investors to provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to the company, could I please ask you for a few closing comments just to wrap up with? Thank you. Yeah, no, we, again, appreciate everybody's time today. We're really excited um, with, you know, the way that 21 ended. Um, we see a, a tremendous opportunity in 2022 uh, as we move forward, uh, both from a pricing perspective uh, in the long-term uh, natural gas environment. Um, like I said before, hashtag unleash US LNG. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, we, we see an opportunity set in terms of being able to grow the company in a substantial way um, as we enter and, and exit 2022 and really set ourselves up for uh, a, a next decade of, of tremendous growth and, and, and opportunity. So we, we again, thank you all for your time. And um, if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out to our investor relations group. That's great. Rusty, Eric, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to update investors this afternoon. Could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete and I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Diversified Energy Company PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session. So good afternoon to you all.